the sun, both the giver of life and destroyer of worlds, host to the eight planets with its gravity and incubator of Earth with its light and heat. Our star has played a pivotal role in sustaining life on this world for over 4 billion years and has figured in human civilization since our earliest ancestors opened their eyes. Yet in spite of its blinding brilliance, the true nature of the sun's power remains shrouded in mystery, with scientists unable to account for many of the processes playing out in its upper atmosphere. But in 2024, NASA will attempt their closest swoop of the sun so far coming less than 5 million miles from its torrid surface. And once they do, they will dive into a new frontier of heliophysics, the nether zone of the solar atmosphere, to study every particle, image every eruption, and feel every interaction that ensues, as humanity strives for its ultimate glimpse of the sun. The sun has been at the heart of the human experience since the earliest sapient beings, from Neanderthals to the Aboriginals to Mesopotamia and beyond. Prehistoric humans have always recognised this glowing object in the sky as an essential part of life on this world. But from the surface of this planet, our perception of the sun is deceptively simple for all we really see is the radiating ball of light. But in reality, this ball is a gigantic, continuously churning nuclear furnace, a persistent explosion of plasma, emitting a crushing gravitational influence and vice-like magnetic field, rendering its true extent far larger, hotter and more complex. At its core, the weight of the sun crushes atomic hydrogen nuclei into heavier nuclei such as helium. In the hyper-energetic process of proton-proton chain nuclear fusion, which powers main sequence sun-like stars. This process generates an enormous amount of light, heat and energy, which diffuses outwards into the sun's exterior layers, trickling out from the core into the mysterious radiative zone. This torrid, unforgiving region encompasses about 45% of the sun's interior, and acts as the transition zone between the core fuel supply and its outlying layers. Within the radiative zone, particles swell more slowly as they are smothered within a jam-packed swarm, taking anywhere from a few hundred thousand to several million years to well up into the next layer of the sun the convection zone. Here, the relentless bombardment from radiation subsides, and plasma propagates with much more room to breathe. Energized particles rise up towards the sun's surface before cooling and sinking back down again to warmer depths, in a cycle of convection. The insane energies arising from fusion further down force the sun's plasma outwards puffing up its visible edge, which is in turn lugged back by the star's immense gravitational influence until the two forces find balance in hydrostatic equilibrium. This yields a persistent visible outer edge for the sun's spherical plasma soup, which determines its conventional size, known as the photosphere. And it is the photosphere that we see when we look up at the sky, from which the majority of the sun's light is scattered. But this is not a solid surface, and is instead more like the base layer of the next, even more punishing and perplexing component of the sun. Its scorching, superheated atmosphere. As the hottest plasma reaches the sun's surface, it bubbles up and dislodges swathes of charged particles, 
which becomes swept up along the lines of the sun's magnetic field. This creates long, arcing streams of explosive plasma, which rise and fall from the photosphere, embedded with their own magnetic fields. Collectively, these magnetized streams rage around the near-solar environment to make up the sun's corona, the turbulent solar atmosphere laced with some of its most intriguing mysteries. Only slightly above the sun's surface, extreme, poorly understood magnetic processes take place, and temperatures skyrocket from around 6,000 Kelvin on the photosphere to upwards of a million Kelvin by the tip of the transition region. A thin, sparse and irregular shell surrounding the photosphere, which acts as a gateway to the immense magnetic storm swirling above. The coronal region extends dozens of times farther into space than the photosphere, sizzling at millions of kelvins within its streams, where most of the sun's wide-reaching effects originate. But for the longest time, it was assumed that the radiant photosphere would be the hottest part of the sun's exterior, with temperatures falling linearly with distance from the surface. Exactly what drives the sun's atmosphere to be so much unfathomably hotter and more intense than its surface is dubbed the coronal heating problem. One of the most enduring unanswered questions surrounding the nature of the sun, and one which NASA hopes to shed light on in 2024. Within the solar atmosphere, charged particles are tethered to the sun bound into flows by immense magnetic and gravitational influences. However, if these particles stray a certain distance from the photosphere, they may reach a boundary known as the Alphane critical surface, essentially the outer edge of the sun's coronal region. Beyond it, particles such as protons, electrons and heavy ions can break free of the sun's grasp causing them to shoot off into space at breakneck speeds of hundreds of kilometers per second, accelerated by a currently unknown magnetic phenomenon. This supersonic outflow of charged particles, known as the solar wind, billows away from the sun in all directions, expanding several times farther than the scale of the planetary neighborhood, to create a windsock-like coma of emissions around the solar system known as the heliosphere. And the conditions within the heliosphere dictate the solar climate and the space weather environment. Space weather is the set of conditions endured by the Earth within the interplanetary medium, largely as a result of the Sun's activity. It is a vitally important area of study because it carries a number of wide-reaching implications for our planet and the digital world. A stormy, eruptive sun emits high volumes of plasma and radiation from its corona, which can threaten the stability and instruments aboard our many thousands of space-borne satellites. Whereas a silent, dormant sun undergoing few atmospheric eruptions might expose Earth's environment to a greater number of intergalactic cosmic rays to the same effect. The transition between these two eventualities is marked by an 11-year cycle playing out in the Sun's magnetic field, which becomes tangled, switches its poles, and then repeats the process as it moulds back into its original shape, driving synchronised fluctuations in coronal activity, solar wind, and the number of sunspots on the photosphere. At the start of this cycle, the solar minimum, the sun is relatively calm, with a highly ordered magnetic field, and thus few disturbances or outbursts perturbing its atmosphere. Solar activity is low, and the Earth may experience cold snaps as a result. But not for very long, as this balance will inevitably be disrupted as the cycle progresses. As the sun rotates, it bulges slightly at its equator, 
dragging its magnetic field until its flux lines start to tangle, stirring the slumbering star. Gradually, sunspots start to emerge on the photosphere, raised mounds of cooling plasma which cluster around the lines of the disturbed magnetic field. These spots act as the basins for coronal loops, which power the majority of the most pervasive space weather effects, especially at the peak of the cycle, the solar maximum, when the field is most tangled and the sun is at its most stormy. As these twisted field lines reset themselves, they snap back into place like the tensioned strings of an instrument, a process known as magnetic reconnection, which transfers huge amounts of energy, catalyzing enormous electromagnetic explosions within the corona. These are known as solar flares, and they emit high volumes of ionizing radiation, sometimes in the direction of Earth. However, if one of these explosions occurs within a free-streaming arc of coronal plasma, then billions of tons of electrically charged, magnetized ejecta will be dislodged along with it and cast into space at supersonic speeds. These are known as coronal mass ejections, by far the most significant type of solar outburst, often occurring alongside solar flares and increased solar wind with each type bringing its own set of challenges when barreling in the direction of Earth. For the most part, our planet's own magnetic field shields us from the most detrimental effects of space weather, by deflecting harmful solar wind particles along its lines of flux. These charged particles strike the atoms in Earth's atmosphere exciting their accompanying electrons and causing them to glow, illuminating the sky with shimmering, bedazzling aurorae. But a strong solar flare releases large quantities of high-energy radiation, like X-rays, gamma rays and ultraviolet emissions. These can lead to greater ionization in the Earth's upper atmosphere, changing its thickness and temperature which can in turn hamper the speed and quality of radio waves, affecting all the digital services they provide. In addition, the instruments aboard older and less sophisticated satellites in the firing line may be damaged, and their orbits around Earth destabilized by sweeping radiation pressure. Furthermore, if a massive, multi-billion ton cloud of ejected coronal plasma trails the solar flare, the outlook for humanity is considerably worsened. A huge stream of electrically charged, magnetized particles ramming into the Earth's magnetosphere would deform its structure, bending it out of place. And much like the Sun, as these field lines snap back into their original configurations via magnetic reconnection, enormous amounts of energy would be transferred into the ionosphere, inducing a geomagnetic storm that floods the atmosphere with electrical currents. The insertion of such currents would wreak havoc on power grids across the planet, causing pylons and transformers to fuse, spark and perhaps even catch fire interrupting domestic power supply for millions of people thereafter. Such an event gripped the Canadian province of Quebec in March 1989, during a period of spiking solar activity at the 22nd documented solar maximum. A huge coronal mass ejection, arising from an aggregation of sunspots, tore across Earth and was caught up in its North Pole before sweeping southwards through North America. The arrival of huge currents in the sky crippled the Hydro-Quebec power grid in under 90 seconds, knocking out power for millions of residents and plunging entire cities into overnight blackouts. Dubbed the day the sun brought darkness, the Quebec incident remains the only recorded geomagnetic storm of the spacefaring age so far that is. But it is not the largest ever to have gripped the Earth, 
as the planet has endured dozens over the past 3,000 years. But for the most intense geomagnetic storm ever recorded, we don't have to go so far back, because partway through the 19th century, observers all over the world witnessed the unprecedented effects of the Carrington event. The Carrington event was the perfect storm, the largest and most intense in history, occurring during an earlier iteration of the solar maximum, at a time when our technological infrastructure was in its infancy. Shortly before midday on the 1st of September 1859, two British astronomers, Richard Carrington and Richard Hodgson, independently recorded the first instance of a colossal solar flare, rising from an aggregation of sunspots. This flare came tearing in the direction of Earth and swept over the planet just minutes later, lacing the sky in high altitudes with a proliferation of magnificent aurorae that same night. But trailing this solar flare was a tremendous coronal mass ejection which came surging over the planet the next morning. In the day that followed, a massive geomagnetic storm ravaged the Northern Hemisphere, sending recently established telegraph systems across Europe and North America into meltdown. Pylons sparked and some even burst into flames, with their operators receiving electric shocks. Though some lines remained active, powered purely by the currents they received from the aurora. On the night of the 2nd of September, at the height of the Carrington storm, the aurora were reported as being even brighter and more intense, and were seen snaking across the sky all over the planet, from Europe and the Americas to Western Australia, China and Japan, and even down to low-latitude, subtropical areas such as Mexico, Cuba and Hawaii. The testimonies of its observers are hair-raising to say the least, painting a picture of awe and appreciation for their unparalleled, illustrious brilliance. Lights of every imaginable colour were issuing from the southern heavens, one fading away only to give place to another more beautiful than the last. The light was greater than that of the moon at its full, but had an indescribable softness and delicacy that seemed to envelop everything upon which it rested. A sight never to be forgotten, considered to be the greatest aurora ever recorded, the rationalist and the pantheist alike saw nature in her most exquisite robes. No geomagnetic storm since has ever come close to the scale of the Carrington event. The aforementioned Quebec blackout was the only one of the space age so far, but it was less than half the strength of the coronal mass ejection that battered Earth in 1859. And if a similarly sized geomagnetic storm gripped the world in 2024, the impacts on our modern day society would be unprecedented. Given the sheer number of critical services that rely on radio and satellite communication, everything from public services, to healthcare, supply chains, and even airspace and maritime navigation would be affected. In the event of a strong solar flare ionising the upper atmosphere, radio waves would seize up and the GPS network would be severely impaired. Flights, shipping, logistics, and even military activities would be disrupted, and that is before the arrival of the trailing stream of charged particles, embedded with magnetic fields. A Carrington-sized coronal mass ejection today would overwhelm, spark, and cripple power grids across the globe, especially in high-latitude areas of the Northern Hemisphere, where the storm would begin. Cities and towns across Europe, Asia and North America would be thrown into chaos as their power supplies failed, with electricity blackouts for at least 12 hours, but perhaps much longer in harder to reach rural areas. The knock-on effects of everything from the loss of mains electricity, 
to water purification would also impede our capacity to respond. Hospitals would struggle to meet surging demand while maintaining their vital services, and a loss of wireless communication and global positioning would complicate relief efforts for the worst hit areas. After the initial few days, characterised by blackouts and blind panic, what follows would probably play out similarly to the events of the COVID pandemic, with flights grounded, supply chains hit, and services stretched and overwhelmed, followed by a longer, more protracted economic fallout. Insurers have forecast the clean-up cost of a Carrington-sized geomagnetic storm for the United States alone as anywhere between $750 billion and $3 trillion. And as we've seen since COVID, this would translate to higher prices, squeezed household budgets, and more compromising standards of living overall long after the novelty of any globally visible aurora has faded away. It's not quite an asteroid sending us back to the Stone Age, but unlike an asteroid, the prospect of a geomagnetic storm is considerably more likely. In fact, only as recently as 2012, during the previous solar maximum, did a Carrington-sized coronal mass ejection come uncomfortably close to bombarding the Earth only narrowly skimming our planet from just 9 million kilometres. It wasn't fully appreciated at the time, and it failed to grab major headlines, despite the hugely disruptive potential it carried with it. But while it didn't come close enough to strike Earth, it did sweep across one of NASA's space-based solar satellites, Stereo A, part of a number of ongoing initiatives to sample understand, and ultimately mitigate the effects of space weather. Stereo A was one of a pair of twin spacecraft launched by NASA in 2006, tasked with studying the solar terrestrial relationship and surrounding environment. Armed with five cameras, as well as particle detectors and radio probes, it has helped build up a comprehensive, 3D picture of the Sun, and was the ideal probe for studying the near miss of 2012, revealing profound insights into the magnetic structures, shockwaves, and particles associated with coronal mass ejections. Long before that, a number of previous missions to study space weather stoked our appetite for heliophysics with each revealing their own secrets about the Sun and the interplanetary medium. In 1995, NASA and the European Space Agency launched a collaborative spacecraft known as the Solar Heliospheric Observatory, or SOHO, the first probe to assemble an internal picture of the Sun's inner workings by imaging and investigating the convection patterns imprinted on its photosphere. It provided the clearest pictures yet of sunspots and their associated coronal activity, and in turn, catapulted the field of helioseismology to a forefront in solar science. It continues to probe the sun to this day, alongside Stereo A and in February 2010, they were joined in orbit by another, next-generation solar surveyor, NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. It carries a broad range of more sophisticated instruments, like improved magnetometers and ultraviolet spectrometers, alongside high-resolution cameras which capture new images of the Sun every single second including invaluable shots of coronal loops, solar flares, and mass ejections. But none of these observatories will get as close, or deliver as much new information, as NASA's crowning solar observatory, the Parker Solar Probe, a flagship spacecraft of the 21st century, which promises to take our knowing of the Sun to brand new heights over the next two years. 
Parker is a groundbreaking solar surveyor with astounding resilience. It is the product of NASA's audacious endeavour to touch a star, by passing through the coronal region itself. The spacecraft has approached closer and travelled faster than any other artificial object, providing humanity with its clearest glimpse of the sun so far. First conceived all the way back in the late 1950s, Parker employs futuristic, state-of-the-art thermal engineering technologies that were not widely available before the new millennium. With a sunshield that protects its four main suites of instruments, each tasked with investigating their own piece of the coronal puzzle. It studies the sun's magnetic field and its interactions, by tracing the paths of particles caught up in its hellish dance. It also images the flows within the coronal region to understand how the sun's atmospheric plasma evolves into supersonic solar wind. And during its perihelion, it draws close enough to the sun to touch its very atmosphere, transiting through the corona to map the solar dynamics. The spacecraft lifted off from Earth on the 12th of August 2018, only shortly after it was renamed in honour of the late solar physicist Dr Eugene Parker, who developed the first mathematical models of solar wind. Despite passing away back in 2022, he remains the only scientist ever to witness the launch of a spacecraft bearing their name. His namesake probe spent its first few months of operation taking short elliptical laps through the inner solar system, occasionally latching onto the gravity of Venus during flybys to tighten its orbit as it spiralled further inwards towards its target. Almost straight away, its cameras began returning the clearest images yet of solar phenomena, revealing a 3D ocean of plasma proliferated by waves and turbulence, and peppered with switchback emissions closer to the surface. Switchbacks are S-shaped kinks in the magnetic fields of the solar wind. They were first identified by the ESA's Ulysses spacecraft back in the mid-1990s, but were initially written off as irregular magnetic anomalies exclusively confined to the Sun's polar region. But in 2019, Parker found them to be abundant close to the photosphere, and would spend the next few years homing in on their origins. In April 2021, Parker prepared for its closest encounter yet with our neighbourhood star, starting an infall that would take it less than one-tenth the distance of Earth, to within 13 million kilometres of the surface or 18.8 solar radii. Almost immediately, it detected changes in the environment and slowdowns in particles consistent with the Sun's atmosphere, as Parker became the first spacecraft to breach the Alphane critical surface and enter the coronal region. By August, its cameras had captured incredible, detailed shots of coronal streams, showcasing flows of plasma still tethered within the star's atmosphere, curving under the influence of its strong magnetic forces. In total, Parker passed in and out of the coronal region three times during these months, withstanding temperatures as high as 700 Kelvin. And when face to face with the unflinching glare of the sun, its instruments homed in on the photosphere to shed new light on a range of complex near-solar phenomena. It traced the source of switchbacks to beneath the sun's surface, when it found their associated emissions to be helium-enriched, suggesting they arise from a series of magnetic funnels which intersect convection cells of plasma in the photosphere. They may be the product of magnetic reconnection, or the rolling motion of plasma waves beneath the sun's outer edge. Either way, 
it just goes to show how much more we stand to unravel by attaining the highest resolution glimpse of the sun we possibly can. That's what makes this coming year so exciting, because in late 2024, Parker will go one better, flying closer to the sun's surface than ever before, as it once again transits the corona to make its ultimate perihelion. As of the making of this video, in early 2024, Parker is undertaking its 18th orbit of the sun, having made one of its closest approaches just before Christmas. It will execute a further three solar flybys over the course of this year, before swinging round Venus one last time. On the 6th of November, Parker will receive its seventh and last orbit tightening gravitational assist, as it rears up on the sun for the final time, en route to its closest approach. By Christmas Eve 2024, it will have drawn just 6.1 million kilometres from the photosphere, merely 4% the distance of Earth, and around twice as close on average as its transits in 2021. Once back inside the coronal region, the craft will be exposed to temperatures exceeding 1,600 Kelvin, but will weather its storm by only spending a short while up close racing through at a dizzying top speed of some 690,000 km per hour, like flying from London to New York in less than 30 seconds, by far the fastest artificial object ever to have graced the skies. Its passage will once again take it within the stellar nether zone, to sample every magnetic influence and feel every interaction aiming to reveal the hidden subtleties of solar particles. It will look to constrain the temperature, density and structures within the corona, studying the role of magnetic reconnection and the effects of tangled field lines. It will also sample the minute properties of solar plasma, recording the traits and behaviour of the ions and subatomic particles that eventually evolve into solar wind. And if a solar storm ignites while Parker is in the vicinity, then it goes without saying that the spacecraft will have a front row seat for capturing this most spectacular of light shows. It will be a nerve-wracking encounter because the probe won't be able to beam back what it sees until after it has receded to a safer distance, and will need to hold onto its findings under extreme conditions in the meantime. But once it is clear, it will beam back some of the best, highest resolution shots of the sun we've ever witnessed, promising to blow its most perplexing mysteries wide open. From the nature of coronal heating, to the mechanism powering the acceleration of solar wind. The answers to decades-old questions and mysteries may finally be revealed as soon as 2025, and will surely go down as a landmark year in the study of the solar system. In the meantime, Parker will make at least two additional flybys of the Sun from a similar distance, as it continues to study the near-solar environment. Further flybys may be possible thereafter, but only from a farther distance, as the craft's orbit will no longer afford it any course-correcting flybys of Venus by then. And inevitably, probably during the middle of the decade, Parker will run out of the fuel needed to keep it in a stable orbit, and the spacecraft will veer off course and conclude its mission bringing to an end one of the most impressive scientific feats of the century. As Parker spirals off into the sun under its immense gravitational influence, it will be exposed to intolerable levels of radiation and heat, eventually burning up and disintegrating long before it reaches the photosphere. But fear not, because NASA does have a plan to touch the surface of the sun itself. Next time, they'll try going back at night.
And with that, I bid you good night. C signing out.